Hi, I've decided to go ahead and give you an audio version of this um, from the History of the Dividing Line by William Byrd. Um, so uh, I did give you a PDF, but in case it helps move you along the reading, here we go. <clears throat> this is from William Byrd's History of the Dividing Line. We have an excerpt in the book that has always been a requirement. We added this particular excerpt as well because we think it shows some interesting uh, elements of Southern literature. So that is what we're looking at, is how this piece by William Byrd differs from what we've seen from the Puritans. Um, and I think it's pretty apparent. Here we go. Before I enter upon the journal of the line between Virginia and North Carolina, it will be necessary to clear the way to it by showing how the other British colonies on the main have, one after another, been carved out of the Virginia by grants from his majesty's royal predecessors. All that part of the Northern American continent, now under the dominion of, king, of the King of Great Britain and stretching quite as far as the Cape of Florida, went at first under the general name of Virginia. The only distinction in those early days was that all the coast to the southward of Chesapeake Bay was called South Virginia and all to the northward of it, North Virginia. The first settlement of this fine country was owing to that great ornament of the British nation, Sir Walter Raleigh, who obtained a grant thereof from Queen Elizabeth of ever glorious memory by letters patent dated March 25th, 1584. But whether that gentleman ever made a voyage thither himself is uncertain, because those who have favored the public with an account of his life mention nothing of it. However, thus much may be depended on, that Sir Walter invited sundry persons of distinction to share in his charter and join their purses with his in the laudable project of fitting out a colony to Virginia. Accordingly, two ships were sent away that very year under the command of his good friends, uh, Amadis and Barlow, to take possession of the country in the name of his royal mistress, the Queen of England. The, these worthy commanders, for the advantage of the trade winds, sharped their first course to the Caribbean Islands, thence stretching away by the Gulf of Florida, dropped anchor not for, far from Roanoke Inlet. They ventured ashore near that place upon an island now called Colleton Island, where they set up the arms of England and claimed the adjacent country in right of their sovereign lady, the queen, and the ceremony being duly performed, they kindly invited the neighboring Indians to traffic with them. These poor people at first approached the English with great caution, having heard much of the treachery of the Spaniards and not knowing but these strangers might be as treacherous as they. But at length, discovering a kind of good nature in their looks, they ventured to draw near and barter their skins and furs for the baubles and trinkets of the English. These first adventures made a very profitable voyage, raising at least a thousand percent upon their cargo. Amongst other Indian commodities, they brought over some of that bewitching vegetable tobacco. That's one of my favorite lines. And this being the first that ever came to England, Sir Walter thought he could do no less than make a present of some of the brightest of it to his royal mistress for her own smoking. The queen graciously accepted it, but finding her stomach sicken after two or three whiffs, twas presently whispered by the Earl of Leicester's, I don't know these names, faction that Sir Walter had certainly poisoned her. But her majesty, soon recovering her disorder, obliged the Countess of Nottingham and all her maids to smoke a whole pipe out amongst them. As it happened some ages before to be the fashion to saunter to the Holy Land and go upon other quick exotic adventures, so it was now grown the humor to take to a trip to America. The Spaniards had lately discovered rich mines in their part of the West Indies, which made their maritime neighbors eager to do so. This modish frenzy, like basically conforming to what's considered fashionable, being still more inflamed by the charming account given of Virginia by the first adventurers, made many fond of removing to such a paradise. So notice he's kind of scoffing at this idea of a promised land, but you can see that the tone of this particular piece is much different than anything we read from the Puritans. I mean, he's talking about about what's fashionable, what, what people, you know, where people are traveling, etc. Just wait. Happy was he, and still happier she, that could get themselves transported, fondly expecting their coarsest utensils in that happy place would be of massy silver. This made it easy for the company to procure as many volunteers as they wanted for their new colony. But like most other undertakers who have no assistance from the public, they starved the design by too much frugality for unwilling to launch out at first into too much expense. They shipped off but a few people at a time and those but scantily provided. The adventurers were besides idle and extravagant and expected they might live without work in so plentiful a country.
These wretches were set ashore. Let me try that again. These wretches were set ashore, not far from Roanoke Inlet, but by some fatal disagreement or lazy laziness, were either starved or cut to pieces by the Indians. Several reported misadventures of this kind did for some time allay the itch of sailing to this new world, but the distemper broke out again about the year 1606. Then it happened that the Earl of Southampton and several other persons eminent for their quality and estates were invited into the company who applied themselves once more to people the then almost abandoned colony. For this purpose, they embarked about a hundred men, most of them reprobates of good families and related to some of the company who were men of quality and fortune. The ships that carried them made a shift to find a more direct way to Virginia and ventured through the capes into the Bay of, Ch Bay of Chesapeake. The same night they came into anchor at the mouth of Pohout, Hotten, the same as the James River, where they built a small fort at a place called Point Comfort. This settlement stood its ground from that time forward, in spite of all the blunders and disagreements of the first adventurers and the many calamities that befell the colony afterward. The six gentlemen, who were first named the company by the crown and who were empowered to choose an annual president from among themselves, were always engaged in factions and quarrels, while the rest detested work more than famine. At this rate, the colony must have come to nothing had it not been for the vigilance and bravery of Captain Smith, who struck a terror into all the Indians round about. This gentleman took some pains to persuade the men to plant Indian corn, but they looked upon all labor as a curse. They chose rather to depend upon the musty provisions that were sent from England, and when they failed, they were forced to take more pains to seek for wild fruits in the woods than they would have taken in tilling the ground. Besides, this exposed them to be knocked in the head by the Indians and gave them fluxes in the bargain. Basically, uh, this also gave them diarrhea. So there's a little bit of a joke there. Which thinned the plantation very much. To supply this mortality, they were reinforced the following year with a greater number of people, amongst which were fewer gentlemen and more laborers, who, however, took care not to kill themselves with work. These found the first adventurers in a very starving condition, but relieved their wants with the fresh supply they brought with them. From... Cacauten, they extended themselves as far as Jamestown, where, like true Englishmen, they built a church that cost no more than 50 pounds, no more than 50 pounds, and a tavern that cost 500. <laughs> they now had made peace with the Indians, but there was one thing wanting to make that peace lasting. The natives could by no means persuade themselves that the English were heartily their friends so long as they disdained to intermarry with them. And in earnest, had the English consulted with their own security and the good of the colony, had they intended to either civilize or convert these Gentiles, they would have brought their stomachs to embrace this prudent alliance. The Indians are generally tall and well-proportioned, which may make full amends for the darkness of their complexions. Add to this that they are healthy and strong, with constitutions untainted by lewdness and not enfeebled by luxury. Besides, morals and all considered, I cannot think the Indians were much greater heathens than the first adventurers, who, had they been good Christians, would have had the charity to take this only method of converting the natives to Christianity. After all that can be said, a sprightly lover is the most prevailing missionary that can be sent amongst these or any other infidels or non-believers. Mm -hmm. That's one way to spread the word. Beside the poor Indians would have had less reason to complain that the English took away their land if they had received it by way of a portion with their daughters. Had such affinities been contracted in the beginning, how much bloodshed had been prevented and how populous would the country have been and consequently how considerable. Nor would the shade of skin been of any reproach at this day, for if a moor may be washed white in three generations, surely an Indian might have been blanched in two. Boy, this is a different tone, isn't it? The French, for their parts, have not been so squeamish in Canada, who, upon trial, find abundance of attraction in the Indians. Their late grand monarch thought it not below even the dignity of a Frenchman to become one flush with this, with this people, and therefore ordered 100... Um, basically it's a currency, 100 for any, uh, leavers, for any of his subject, man or woman that would intermarry with a Nate, with a native by this piece of policy, we find the French interest very much strengthened among the savages and their religion, such it is, such as it is propagated just as far as their love. And I heartily wish. 
this well-concerted scheme don't hereafter give the French an advantage over his majesty's good subject on the northern continent of America. About the same time, New England was paired off from Virginia by letters, patent bearing date April 10th, 1608. Several gentlemen of the town and neighborhood of Plymouth obtained this grant with the Lord Chief Justice Popham at their head. Their bounds were specified to extend from 38 to 45 degrees of northern latitude with a breadth of 100 miles from the seashore. The first 14 of this company encountered many difficulties and lost many men, though far from being discouraged, they sent over numerous recruits of Presbyterians every year who, for all that had much ado to stand their ground with all their fighting and praying. But about the year 1620, a large swarm of dissenters fled thither from the severities of their stepmother, the church. These saints, conceiving the same aversion to the copper complexion of the natives with that of the first adventurers to Virginia, would on no terms contract alliances with them. Afraid, perhaps, like the old Jews of old, lest they might be drawn into idolatry by those strange women, you know, fetishism or I. Uh, adoration. Whatever disgusted them, I can't say, but this false delicacy creating in the Indians a jealousy or an insecurity that the English were ill-affected towards them was the cause that many of them were cut off and the rest exposed to various distresses. This reinforcement was landed not far from Cape Cod, where for their greater security they built a fort and near it a small town, which in honor of the proprietors was called New Plymouth. But they still had many discouragements to struggle with, though by being well supported from home, they, by degrees, triumphed over them all. Their brethren, after this, flocked over so fast that in a few years they extended the settlement 100 miles along the coast, including Rhode Island and Martha's Vineyard. Thus, the colony throve apace and was thronged with large detachments of independents and Presbyterians who thought themselves persecuted at home. Though these people may be ridiculed for some pharisaical peculiarities in their worship and behavior, yet they were very useful subjects as being frugal and industrious, giving no scandal or bad example, at least by any open and public vices, by which excellent qualities they had much the advantage of the Southern colony, who thought their being members of the established church sufficient to sanctify very loose and profligate morals. For this reason, New England improved much faster than Virginia, and in seven or eight years, New Plymouth, like Switzerland, seemed too narrow a territory for its inhabitants. Thank mm -hmm. you.